Bye bye. Yeah. Tweeting. Hi, Laura. Hello, welcome. Abdul. It's lovely to see you. And you as well. Welcome to another welcome to session and this live stream with Shobi. Um, for everyone that's joining us. Um, for those of you that don't know, Shobi is a platform for assessment and feedback. Um, and it delivers rich and very powerful feedback as well. Um, but today I'm absolutely delighted. And actually, you know, um, quite excited, I suppose, as well, to have Laura Dickinson with us from the NTLT. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to see you. It's, I've just been saying it's too long. Uh, the pandemic has had its faults where we haven't been able to catch up. So it's lovely to have this opportunity. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful to have you on board. So I'm going to kind of like get straight to it. Yeah, I want us to tell. So we've got quite a global audience. Um and there's a lot of people that tune in to this kind of um, after it's gone live because it will, will be available on social channels and so on. Um, so Laura, tell me a little bit about yourself first before we go into NCLT and, you know, your kind of uh, experience and expertise there. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How, you know, what's your background? What's your history? How did you get into education? You know, your love for tech and so on and learning. Take us through that. Absolutely. Well, I've actually technically never left school. So when I started primary school, I always wanted to be a teacher. So that was always kind of the route that I wanted to go down. Um, so primary school, secondary school, straight into university um, to qualify as a teacher. However, one of the things that I wanted to do, I wasn't really quite sure whether I wanted to teach um, primary or secondary at the time. So I did a great course um, at the University of Sunderland, which was ICT education, which was uh, Key Stage 2-3. So it allowed me to kind of have placements in primary and secondary, but with an IT background. I've always been interested in tech. It's been one of the things that I've really kind of engaged with in the past. Um, so my degree really stood me in good stead, um, especially at the minute, because um, the first year of my degree was all ICT. So it was things like um, networking, software design, uh, website right. design, all of that kind of thing, hardware, building computers, putting them back together again. Um, and then the second year was half and half. So half education, half IT. And then the third year was purely education. And it's funny because we laugh now at the minute because the IT, so the computing side of what I did in my first year of my degree is what we're actually yeah. teaching Key Stage 2 children now. <laughs> okay. So it is, it's it's scary. Um, so yeah, so qualified 2004, which means that I've been teaching 17 years now, which is totally scary. Um, wow did um kind of the normal progression through so subject lead in ICT and um, had a great time at Kingston Park Primary School and Thockley Primary School and then came out of kind of the classroom and did more of a man, um assistant headship role at a school in North Tyneside and then this Elan and lead practitioner role came up um as part of the trust and it I was at that point of my career where I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted headship or not but knew that I needed a new challenge um, so took on this role in 2015 and literally have the best job in the world. It's It's been <laughs> amazing for me professionally to kind of work with so many skilled and amazing people out there, but also to be able to support the number of schools that I have in the Northeast. So it's, yeah, yeah it's been a, yeah. a kind of a traditional journey, but one that has been amazing. That's, that's, that's pr pretty fantastic. So um, I have a confession to make as well. So I went to the University of Sunderland. No way, you did not. Yeah, I did I did? I was there for four years. Um, my degree was in uh, pharmaceutical sciences. Right. Um, uh, absolutely nothing to do with teaching. Um, I then kind of uh, went to London. I had a job at Glaxo Pharmaceuticals yeah. doing method development and all this kind of sciencey stuff. Um, and then after that, um, I went to the University of Leicester to do my PGCE. But yeah, I'm very, very familiar with Sunderland. I was there for four years. That was home. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and for someone who is a lifelong season ticket Newcastle United fan, it was really hard for me to go to Sunderland. <laughs> yes. uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was really lucky to have the best course tutors and a really good stand and kind of get me going into what, what 
what eventually became my career. So yeah, it was a, a great place to go. And it's it's kind of it's kind of a, it's been an interesting time, certainly over the last ten years, in the way in which technology has changed in schools. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, we went from having well, you know people that have been in the profession longer, maybe even before my time. Um, I suppose they'll probably talk about those BBC computers, one in a school. Then we kind of moved to this um, computer room kind of uh, mentality where we would kind of, you know, book that facility out. And then it was like laptop trolleys. And then we began to hear about one-to-one programs and so on. So in a quite a short space of time, you know, the how we use technology and the type of technology that we've used has suddenly kind of changed. So that's kind of interesting. And I will we'll kind of do talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But now tell us a little bit about NTLT. So remember, we've got like a bit of a global audience. Tell yeah. us where you're located um, and tell us a little bit about the North Tyneside Learning Trust. Yeah, so it, it's a really unique setup, actually. So we are a, a group of 47 schools based in North Tyneside, which is in the north of England. So we're just kind of outside of the borders of Newcastle. Um, and we are ha- fortunate to have um, both two tier, so primary and secondary schools, and three tier schools, which are first, middle and high schools as part of our trust. Uh, we've got some special schools as well. So we've got 26 uh, first and primary schools, four middle schools, nine um, secondary schools, five special schools, an academy and a pupil referral unit in there as well. But the unique thing about us is is that we're not a multi-academy trust. We're a collaborative trust. So we joined together 10 years ago because we didn't want to lose our identity in terms of individual schools when the whole mat was on on the agenda. So our schools are a collaborative trust So we all work together to support each other around um, a a kind of a STEM focus, um, bringing in our science learning partnership that we host and our Great North Maths Hub that we host. But my role kind of with the digital um, technology sits there. So we also have the North Tyneside Apple Regional Training Centre. Um, so my role as the e-learning lead is to kind of bring all of the digital side to all of our schools and empower our staff and our students to get the best out of the technology that they have and provide them with a real good digital foundation for their careers and where they move on to next. That's 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 pretty fantastic and actually quite quite forward thinking to have a role um, that's working across all these organizations. And that must bring a lot of kind of um, expertise, right? Because the opportunity to share things um, is, is pretty amazing across such a, such a large group of schools. Absolutely. And we have such a wealth of knowledge in terms of even across platforms. So because we're not a Mac, schools can decide which platforms they use. So whether they want to use Microsoft or Google or Apple. So we have that wealth of knowledge and expertise. We have Apple Distinguished Educators as part of our trust. We also have Microsoft Innovative Educators as well. And it's great because it means that and we're currently running a trial with Shelby at the minute because we find that the things work best in schools when you've got a community around them that are engaged yeah. and on board. So yeah. one of the things we're developing at the minute is a Shoby community where we've yeah. got teachers from our primary schools and our middle schools all working together using Shoby and then feeding back to each other about what's worked well and what hasn't. And we've kind of replicated that pattern throughout the time that I've been a digital lead to really try and get the most out of, because technology is expensive and trying to get people to buy into it is really, really difficult. And the only way that you're going to have that sustainable outcome at the end is if you have that buy-in. And often it's really hard when you're isolated as a teacher and that one person in that role to try and have that influence so that's why we try and build communities around what we do to try and move that forward. Yeah, I think I think that's it's, it's such a, such a powerful point, and I think one of the things that I I quite like about Shelby and how the team works here is that you know it's it's very much about running that trial like an evidence based approach. Like it's not about just kind of hey here's Shelby buy it and use it and so on, but 
the ability to run a trial for the school at no cost, but actually, you know, understanding like how is this really going to impact learning? How is it going to benefit us? What can we do now that we couldn't do before? And so on um, really allows schools, educators, decision makers to come to a come to a decision that's informed, you know, yes. rather than kind of trying something out or you've, you're you actually stuck with it now for the next 12 months and actually nobody's using it, you know. Um, yes. That's kind of great to hear. How many schools are involved in that trial? So at the, the, the first trial that we've got running at the minute is eight schools, but the idea yeah. is, is that they will then identify a member of staff in their school who will continue on this kind of second cohort because what we've realised is that um, it's really hard when it's just one member of staff who's trying to lead change yeah. in their school. So we're yeah. trying to kind of buddy up, so have a second person in that cohort and then bring some new schools on board as well. So hopefully by January, February time, we'll have about 16 to 20 schools all kind of taken part in, in, in the rollout, which will be great. And I think it's hard, especially it, with the pandemic, it almost forced leadership teams to kind of plump for a learning platform that was just going to see them through the pandemic yeah. and I think a lot of schools kind of managed really well with what they had but Absolutely. are now starting to reflect and say right okay well we've been using Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom but actually the platform we've been using was never built solely for education so actually it mm -hmm. does some things really well but it's missing some other things yeah. and I think kind of coming out of the pandemic now it's given leadership teams who can now see the benefits of technology because of what's happened it's given them time to reflect and really say right okay if we're kind of planning for a hybrid world we're moving forward what tool is going to benefit our students the most and yeah. the feedback that we're getting from from the Shelby trial so far is that because Shelby has been developed for education you don't have those missing links of what's missing in Google Classroom or Seesaw uh, or kind of Microsoft Teams. It's all there. It's a kind of a yeah. comprehensive package because it's yeah. been developed by educators. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's a, it's an even better if conversation, isn't it? Right? Yeah. You know, we've been using this and lots of schools jumped onto kind of like, you know, um, Google and, 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 and Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams and so on, which is, which is great. And I think it played a really good role during the yeah, pandemic absolutely. Uh, and allowed kind of educators to kind of connect with children and continue learning and so on. But actually, um, you know, having something that's specifically designed for assessment, feedback, learning with that goal solely in mind um, is going to be significantly different. It's going to kind of build. Uh, and of course, you know, you can then use it alongside uh, Google and uh, Microsoft or the Apple ecosystem as well. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of really, really quite interesting in many ways. To be honest with you, I have I have been um up to some schools um, at the North Tyneside Learning Trust. And it's it's always a fascinating visit. I remember my first visit up there was to Stevenson Memorial. Yeah. Primary school. Yeah. And I think it was when Emma was there as the head teacher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Emma is now in Barcelona. She's in yeah, Spain. Yeah, she's right? the head of the British School of Barcelona. Yeah, the primary school. Yeah, part. that's right. That's right. So I, I remember coming there and... One of the things that, that really kind of struck out to me was the context in which that school was because the levels of deprivation was really yeah. high. Uh, I remember coming into the school and there was a breakfast club, like actually children were coming to have their breakfast yeah. um, in school, right? Um, and, you know, the, the kind of progress that was made with that was, was pretty fascinating. The learning experiences were really amazing. There was significant investments being made uh, into families as well, which was really yeah. kind of powerful. Um, and the other school that I, I'll always remember visiting, and I, I think we did a, a couple of teach meets or something, there as well um was churchill yes uh, the church churchill sec high school secondary school high, uh, high school yeah churchill high yeah Churchill High. And then that was obviously quite fascinating. And there's a pretty amazing kind of story. Is it David that was there, the head teacher? Yes. Yeah, so David Baldwin yeah. was the head at the time. Yeah. He's now our education strategic lead. But Fantastic. I was really lucky to be brought into the trust with such forward thinkers like Emma and Ooh. David. Absolutely. Ooh. Really great guy. I love, love speaking and sitting down and just uh, talking to David and so on. Um, but 
that whole journey um, for Churchill to outstanding was 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 pretty phenomenal. Um, yeah. And there was there was some, there was some really really good stuff that's going on over there. So I'm I'm hoping that in the future, and I'm sure you will, um, when there is um, you know kind of more movement and less worry and concern about COVID and pandemic and so on, that actually people that are listening to this would um, probably come up for events and even kind of see um, what you guys have built up there, the kinds of things that you're doing there, which is which is pretty phenomenal in many ways. Um, Absolutely. And you're more than welcome to come up and join us and have, and have a chat as well. That would be great. <laughs> so, Laura, one other thing I do know that you're involved with is the whole Digi Ladies stuff. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Tell me about that. How did that come about? What are you guys doing? What's all that about? Okay, so it came from um, a, a meeting that I was part of um, with the Apple Regional Training Centre community. So I was invited as part of the advisory board to go down to London to have a meeting. And I got down to London, uh, to Apple's offices in London, walked into the room, and I was the only female in the room. So there was me and seven guys. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell you who was dopey. But it got me thinking on the train on the way back to kind of think about, actually, you know what, we have a lot of teachers in education who are female, but actually taking that role of ICT lead is, is quite challenging, especially if you don't have an ICT background as such. Um, and then I was really fortunate to become part of the class of 2017 for the Apple Distinguished Educator Program. And while I was there, I met some amazing people like um, Hannah Crossgree from uh, Donaldson St. Mary's and yeah. Claire Jones, who's now down in Exeton Primary, yeah. um, and Pamela Algy over in Belfast. Yeah. And um, Lisa and Louise, who were at the Wow Zone, who are kind of doing their, their amazing things they're bought in. And I thought, yeah. you know what? We've got a really amazing female body of people, a community there that could really lead um, things with women in tech. Now, I know there's a big push in terms of women in coding in particular, and kind of key stage three is where they're starting to get that input. But for me, I just think we need to really look at engaging with girls particularly in tech at an earlier age the kind of key stage two but yeah. also letting them know what's available in terms of a computer science career but actually there's so many other jobs involving tech for our Absolutely. girls that aren't necessarily code and based and um, so that's where digi ladies was born so it's just a, about a kind of an emp empowering program to get girls to think literally outside of the box and think actually they can do um, the same kind of jobs that anybody else can do and yeah. we've got we're really lucky in the northeast because we've got some amazing tech companies up here and we, we've got a massive kind of development around tech happening over the next couple of years but even just a, a, a little thing like one of we've got a little startup well i'm saying a little startup business a little business park in gateshead which is just over the river from newcastle yeah. um, and proto is based there and we reached out to them as part of our heritology project and we managed to get in touch with a girl who had just finished doing all of the digital artwork for the latest Avengers film and wow. um, so we went down there we had a workshop around VR um, and then she just spoke to the girls and kind of said what her background was that she wasn't the brightest girl in the class but actually she had a, a talent for art and she loved ICT and then th that was nurtured in school and then now she's kind of creating all of the digital artwork for the latest Marvel films. So it, it, it's a passion of mine just to be able to kind of support those girls who might feel that they can do something extra special with tech, but not quite sure yeah. what they can do. Yeah, I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, I'm the only male in my house. Um, it's full <laughs> of females um, and the girls are, you know, it's, it's it's kind of uh, understanding, and I, I don't know whether curriculum has kind of necessarily caught up with this, but um, it's great to kind of see coding and computer science and so on on the curriculum, but there's just so much more that yeah. technology impacts, right? Everything from digital art and design and so on, you know, to, to even kind of like you know, arranging equipment and, and how you kind of set up screens and, you know, plug in cameras and all that kind of stuff and what the best setup is and all this. There's, there's, there's 
just a lot more out there that's absolutely possible. And I think exposing young girls to kind of that those kinds of environments and getting them to understand, you know, what's out there and, and seeing role models like that is actually quite quite empowering and, and, and really, really powerful. So that's yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely. And and I think whilst the pandemic in some ways has been horrific and we've all felt it globally, I think it's been a real positive for our young people because they've been almost forced to develop their digital skills in a way that we would never be able to teach in the classroom. They've had to kind of tried to learn about online learning and had to do hybrid learning the resilience of if you can't get your microphone or your camera work and what do they need to do so all of those problem skills and resilience we've managed to build up in our young people and yeah. actually I was just talking to Sarah before the call there and saying you know down the line where um our, our young people now will be going out for careers all of this all of these digital skills that they wouldn't have necessarily had if the pandemic hadn't have happened will give them such a toolkit to be able to build on when they're going out for their careers, kind of almost at a, an advantage to them than it is to us. And it, it's that kind of, and it's trying to capture that and make sure that the children are aware of the skills that they're developing. So yes, we've got the curriculum to cover, but as yeah. you say, there's so much more that they can use. Absolutely. And if you, even if you look at the, the, the latest Apple advert where they're, they're making movies on iPhones, we've yeah. got some amazing children who are vlogging and using all of that technology at their fingertips. And it's how we then channel that so that they know that they can use that in their career and be yeah. able to kind of develop themselves moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really powerful stuff. So um, moving on, Laura, uh, tell us about like what are, what are the challenges that you're kind of seeing at the moment in education? Right. Um, you know, just generally, maybe like within the UK or even within the trust or generally within schools, you know, what are the barriers to kind of learning or technology adoption and so on? I, th I think for me, that because of the pandemic, we're kind of, we're really trying to, and I don't want to use the word catch up, <laughs> yeah. um, because I feel like it, 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 it almost has that negative connotation, doesn't it, that the children have failed because they haven't been there and it's through no fault of their own. So I think we have a, a massive um, challenge in terms of being able to get our children back to where they should be if we if yeah. we could kind of call it that yeah. um, but making sure that obviously their mental health and their approach to learning because obviously they haven't had that daily interaction with their teachers and their classmates um, and, and then having to then go back into that system quite abruptly from where they had been it's about kind of just readjusting to that routine and be able to move forward obviously because of the, the pandemic as well there's been a lot of investment in terms of kit and I know that we were fortunate in the UK that the DFE, the Department of Education, provided some devices for schools, um, but it wasn't enough. Um, yeah. And that, and what we're finding is, I mean, I know that um, Glasgow and um, Edinburgh and the borders are, are running out an amazing programme at the minute where they're adding the cost of it, an iPad onto their council tax bill so that all children are, um, are, ha are have access to a device. Because we found, especially with, with remote learning in the UK, that a lot of our families may have had or, or were lucky to have a device, but then yeah. they had multiple children at home. So then yeah. you were expecting children to have to try and do their learning on one device, but there could have been three children in the household at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think moving forward, what we need to do is kind of really reflect on um, the pandemic and look at how we develop our teaching to be able to meet those the kind of the mental health of our children but also to be able to develop the um the learning that they've kind of achieved over the pandemic yeah. i mean there's, there's yeah. a great um document that came out from our uh, house of lords called beyond digital preparing for a hybrid world yeah. Um, yeah. and i found that a really useful tool because it does celebrate actually things like working from home I'm yeah. personally really struggling at the minute now having sometimes to go back to the office and have to do the commute because I'm so productive in the morning that's when that's kind of when I am my most productive and when I was working from home I could get up I could do my emails get sorted but now it's kind of getting Daisy my daughter to school to breakfast <laughs> club and then having to sit in traffic for 40 minutes and, and I can't do what I needed to be able to do and it's kind of 
it, it's taking all of those, isn't it? And really reflecting on actually our children have gone through a really tough time. But what 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 positives can we take from that pandemic? So yeah. do we need to look at investment in ICT at a government level or at a school level? Um, I think we're in a much better place in terms of leadership teams and in terms of parental engagement with devices. I think previous to the pandemic, there was a lot of, oh, we don't need that fancy technology in our school. We can, yeah. we, can we, we can do without it. And actually, it is, I mean, some of the best lessons I've taught have been without technology. It is a, it is a tool and it shouldn't be used for every lesson. You use it when it's appropriate. Absolutely. But I think now, we're at the point now where we have that um, engagement with leadership teams and we have that engagement with our parents. So it's looking at how we can best support our families to be able to support their children with devices and their education moving forward. Absolutely. I think there's some there's some great opportunities to kind of make that happen. And I totally agree with you. You know, there's definitely, uh, I think investment, financial investment education has kind of hit the headlines a few times. Uh, in the in the in the past months, um, and I know um, Jeff Barton from Askill has kind of uh, written articles on that as well. Um, I think we do need a significant investment. It's kind of interesting to see that globally, with some countries like Singapore, um, during COVID, the government made an announcement that actually you know every student will have access to a computer. I know Austria has gone down that route. You've yeah. talked about Scotland and the, the way in which they're, they're progressing as well. Um, so absolutely, that is something that is definitely needed. But obviously, that is not the focus. The focus is then, you know, how do we accelerate learning? How do we make it accessible? You know, how, what can teachers do that they weren't able to do in the past? You know, um, I remember being in a room in Glasgow not so long ago and the teacher was just doing a learning check and using Socrative yeah. asked a question could immediately see responses from all the students without losing their flow in teaching and could see which student hadn't responded and the level of misconceptions and all that kind of stuff really powerful stuff dead simple yeah. um but actually um you know it, it really kind of impacted the, the the flow of learning and and what next steps were or to a certain what knowledge that the children already had before uh, a topic started and so on so um i think i think you're right there is a significant kind of investment that is needed um and potentially you know uh a national plan uh, yes. that kind of supports school leaders in doing because a lot of school leaders that I speak to finance is an issue you know yeah. you can't you just can't afford it and in some ways it's kind of crazy to think that you know schools will have com computer rooms that take significant amount of investment and money um, sat there on weekends after school hours not doing anything and not being being used you know yeah. um, so you know, there is a, a huge opportunity for that return on investment. And I completely agree with you on that. I just noticed behind you on your uh -oh. shelf. Which way? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say over your right shoulder. Is that a little stress ball with Shobi on it? It is. And then I've also, <laughs> got, a, I've also got a water bottle here. Oh, yeah. i just seen that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of product placement always works well. But, right. but no, it is. And, and this one you mentioned there about Socrative, yeah. there are so many tools out there now will that will help with teachers' workload. Um, mm. and, and I think as well, kind of coming back into the classrooms, the mental drain on the teachers because of what they're having to deal with in their classrooms, we need to be able to support our education body. And it's it's almost scary on Twitter kind of hearing how many teachers are so drained and so exhausted kind of coming back into the classroom if they haven't kind of been and kind of this year has been really tough on them. Yeah. And, and so, so tools like Socrative to be able to kind of get that instant information without having to go around each individual child and I think it, it's kind of gathering together a, a toolkit for teachers that will help support them in the classroom to reduce their workload so that they have maximum time to be able to spend with their children, but also to be able to look after themselves because we have such amazing educators in our classrooms and we need to protect the profession at the minute, I think. I think we need to really look after them because they're doing such an amazing job in such um, awful circumstances. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, so... Um, Laura, what's kind of next? What are you working on? What's your kind of, you know, 
What do the next 12 months look like? Is it all like, not saying the word catch up, but catch up, yeah. Um, is it, you know, professional development? Is it kind of, you know, empowering teachers with other things kind of technology tools and so on, what does the, the kind of the immediate future look like for you? Um, for me, it's continuing with that professional development, but we're really um, at an exciting time in North Tyneside Learning Trust. So we've just developed it and kind of launched our STEM hub. So previously within the trust, we've kind of really been working in isolation within the subjects. But what we're really wanting to do because of our area and because of the opportunity with STEM careers in, in the northeast of England, we're bringing together a STEM hub. So we've got an amazing lead practitioner, Amy Banks, who's working in science. And then we've got Laura Tullock, who's who's working in maths and we're coming together and really looking at the links across the curriculum so kind oh, of not looking true. at everything in isolation yeah. but looking at how we have that interdependence of skills right yeah. across the curriculum to be able to give that kind of broad and balanced uh, curriculum to our children but without having to try and do it in isolation so it's a really exciting time up in the northeast to kind of be on that journey and kind of see where that goes next Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Laura, um, I told you right at the beginning, I think just before we came live, that 30 minutes will just kind of fly by. And I I'm can't just... believe how quick it's gone. I really can't. <laughs> it's gone, yeah. Um, but look, it's always wonderful to kind of um, speak with you. It's always wonderful to meet you. Are you going to be at BET this year? I am. Yes, I am. So it's, it's going to be really exciting time because we missed it last last time but obviously Nightingale Hospital had to come first <laughs> but yeah really looking forward to kind of connecting with that global community down in bit this year. Okay so we, we will be there and I am looking forward to seeing you and catching up then as well. Thank you so much I really appreciate your time and pass on our love and thanks and you know um, warm wishes to, to all of the people that we know at NTLT you're doing some amazing stuff thank you for joining us. I today. will do thanks so much Abdul that's been lovely thank you. Thank you.